this day. We thank you for just giving my, my babes back to good health and saving my babes' life and guiding through this a scary time and just giving your, your grace and healing and your touch in that situation to um, bring us through. We thank you and we just uh, acknowledge once again your, your love and your support and your healing and your touch of salvation that you give not only in spiritual but also in life as you can continue to sustain and, and bring us through these trials of life. Continue to be with us. Continue to get uh, back to full strength for my babes and just uh, continue to have each of us now just turn to your word and we just thank you for all the love and support we've had for those that uh, you've put in throughout this congregation, this ministry, that the Cumberland Islanders family is the love and support and encourage and appreciate that so much. So continue to be with Todd and Pam on their travels to Wisconsin, Greg and Sandy, Tracy, her family, and Vicki and Dave, Lainey, Rianne, Marcia, and her parents, and Alan, Coletta, and Nancy Harbour, and Lily and Georgette, and Sheila, and Lionel across the pond, and all the folks that, that we know, Father, that are in Jim and, and Nobia, and just throughout the ministry, and are not with us in physical presence, but with us in online, or not able to be either one. We know that we're all still in spirit unified and, and at one with you and knowing that we look to you and want to serve you and please you. And we thank you for all you have done. Continue to be our faithful and loving and giving Father, gracious Father. We thank you for just continuing to give to us not just life, but spiritual life as well. Continue to sustain us. We look now to your word to give insight into this depth and width and breadth and height of what you gave to the Apostle Paul to write the foundation of understanding of the depth within the mysteries of the Word of God, the truth within truth, and how it is unveiled, and now Paul has been given this strength of, of, of power, of might, of mind to write, sometimes in a confusing way, but yet very, very exact, Father, very detailed. We thank you for your giving him this gift. Help us to understand what you have said and what you have written. May you be our guide, our counselor, our teacher, our pastor, our shepherd in this time. We lift all these things up in Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray, amen. So. It's been a while since we were together. Um, I know we missed actually um, Q and A, so I guess we'll pick that up later. Obviously, but uh, we usually do that the first Friday of, of the month. Uh, but we did a introduction to Ephesians, and it was uh, quite a bit of information if you can uh, remember back. But now I wanted to really go through kind of like a pseudo ongoing uh, introduction process of that. But I want to go through chapter one. But actually, um, when I say pseudo, I mean because I'm, usually I'm, I'm going through verse for verse, right? But I want to take still not the introduction but an over gleaning understanding of some things that the Apostle Paul um, was led to say uh, from the Lord himself the spirits who who influenced him obviously we know that there's one author of the of the Word of God God himself but there's many writers okay so we talked already before about the history of, of Ephesus uh, where they were founded the population of that city uh, the origin of, of some of the things around just to highlight to get us where we were. Paul wrote this from prison while in Caesarea. Populations about the size of Orlando, giving an idea. It was founded originally by the Greeks, then also the Romans. There was a false god issue of Artemis, known as Dinah, to the Greek or Roman, respectfully. And Paul was doing a lot of that fighting of that aspect of the people in Ephesus. We also know that Ephesus was a hub for other church plantings, as we call them. It was more of a hub, and people think that the letter of Ephesus, or Ephesians, excuse me, was written not just to a specific congregation, but to the congregations in plural that aggregately made up the people of Ephesus regionally, not so much specifically to an actual uh, four-walled uh, building. We also know that Ephesus, as a, as a uh, trip ticked down to reprise what we talked about, was the place where Paul spent the most amount of time on his journey, three years, uh, only uh, to be seconded by Corinth. He spent 18 months in Corinth. So, but in Ephesians, we know that he's writing to a people, again, he spent three years with. Two of those years he spent in a seminary-type format. He taught at the school of Tyrannus, and it was intimately uh, involved with him being the tutor. Imagine, again, that being uh, your, uh, you know, orientation for sign-up, and you see offering of biblical introduction 101 through uh, 1001 uh, offered by the Apostle Paul as your prof. You're signing up all day long, right? So, so they got to sign up for that for two years. What a wonderful syllabus. I can imagine what it was. Then we also thought Paul talked about some things. We mentioned how it's the beginning of the book he mentions love. At the end he mentions love. He talks about, of course, in Revelation, how they lost their first love. Their mea love was the Word of God. Their protos love was the person, the living Word of God, Christ. 
and so we, we talked about that. We also know that the, uh, the Paul addresses, uh, one thing to look back at, he addresses the two different types of peoples, if you remember, uh, using the grammatical sense. He uses uh, you and us a little differently. And the best way to do that, in a, and we talked about the word you and himas, uh, himas, humas, and himan and human, himas and humas, which end in as in your diglot left side of the margin, are speaking of the saints. I should say the believers actually here, and then, and then that's the specific disciples of sixty fruit and up. Uh, those are the ones he taught in Tyrannus, but there was other people in Ephesus he taught. We know he was there for three years total. So there's also the himan human, which is noted in your scripture as the like the w. Um, N or VN, you will see. Uh, that's the on. So that's the us and you. So one's an accusative case, one's a genitive case. But again, he is talking to one, one book, he's talking to different audiences. So people say, well, how can that be? You're making this up, and that's malarkey. I'm glad you said that. Let me answer that question for you, how that can be the case. We have people in our ministry now today, as we all know, that live in Illinois. Thank you all for being online. We have Laney in Nebraska. We have Sheila across the pond in England. And we have us in Florida. So we got somebody out of the country, we got people in the country, and north and south, and then Midwest, as of now, but not normally. But here's the thing. So if that's the case, if I was saying to you, boy, the, you know, the, you guys know the summers are, 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 are hot. Well, I'm not speaking to Illinois particularly, I'm speaking to people in Florida, because I'm referring to the summers that, I'm, that we're feeling, because I'm the one talking, I'm referring to my geographic location, right? But I say, you all know. I may say things like, just like when it comes to the winter, you guys understand how it gets colder than, than we experience. Well, the way he mentions you, it's, it's a reference to speaking to all the people, but he's specifying one group of folks within a group of people. So there's people that we know that have a problem with sometimes when you read the Word of God, they, they don't like to look at the details. They say, no, uh, when he addresses people, he addresses everybody, and that's not true. They think that everything that's written applies to every person in Christ. It's just not true. It's just not true. And again, to, to make that clear for someone even clearer who's, who's going, okay, you're confusing me in grammar, put it this way. If God was talking to the Israelites in the Old Testament, was he talking to all of them on occasions? Yes. Was he also talking to specific ones of the Levitical priests and the Reubenites and the Ishakarites and the Zebulites? Yes, he was. And the Judahites, the line of kings. Was he not specifying amongst the Israelites a tribe from which he was directing a specific conditions or obligations to and responsibilities. Well, yes. So if God can be specific within a group of general speech to his people, he can be specific in his speech to his people in the Old Testament by fact of the, of the reality there's a Israelites and there's also tribes within there. Well, then we can understand the same thing when it comes to those in Christ. There's those in Christ who are at a lower level of understanding and measure of grace and faith, and those are a different level of measure of grace and faith. They're not lesser or better or worse, they're just different. And they're uniquely set apart by God and His government to do His bidding. It's not about jockeying for a position or insulting somebody or, or lording over somebody like the clergy lady thing, which church entity has done. No, no, no. It's about just understanding your, your, your place and your position. So with that being said, that was the preface for us understanding our beginnings to study the book of Ephesians. You have to understand that Paul is speaking to two audiences, and we saw that in the very first verse, to the saints in Ephesus and to the believers. And he uses the grammatical terms. We saw it. We went through all the verses of that already. So now I, I ended up with talking about how Paul writes that we, speaking of the we, the himas, humas, the, the specific group of 60 fruit are loved so much by the Lord that we should love him. Our knowledge obtained is necessary to be better equipped to draw from resources of the Mia word, written word, to love the protos living word, which is Jesus. The Lord deposited into us all spiritual heavenly blessings in Christ. And I put, wow. And so now I want to build on that and, and go through some other things that we I mentioned, but it has time to, to spend because we took so much time introduction. So let's go to, uh, the, these are every time I basically have highlighted to you the phrases in, in the first chapter, just the first chapter. These are all from the first chapter. How many times Paul says, or God inspires Paul to write in. So we are, we are, we are placed in spiritual blessings, in the heavenlies, in Christ, chosen eklego, which is to be selected in him, in love, which has been preordained. So all that is, is what we're in. So he's talking to people in Ephesians, which is, I mean, insane to think that we're 
in spiritual blessings that are in the heavenlies, that are in Christ, that are chosen in him, that are in love, preordained. Brr. That's a lot. That's a lot of ins. So it's basically, if you look at it from an English standpoint, he's giving you adjectives or descriptive natures of, of elaboration of how deep and rich what we have. Okay? Then, it's interesting, he says, in two. So all this in blessings, in heavenlies, in Christ that were chosen in him, in love preordained, for the purpose of bringing us into, and it's the word H-U-I-O, if you can read that, heiothesia, which is, which is translated adoption, or should say sonship, it should be adoption, which is why it translates it sonship, which is, by the way, I'm looking at verse, I'll get you the verse here, verse uh, 5. So in verse 5 of chapter 1, where he says, we're into sonship, the word is heiothesia, which is adoption. So now he, we're in the spiritual blessings, in the heavenlies, in Christ, chosen in Him, in love, preordained. To for the per, for, so in for the, that we're in that, and then which first you're in. Now you're placed into an adoption. For what reason? Into the praise of the glory of the favor of Himself. Into the preserio, which is the abundant, excessive, lavish lavishing of Himself. Into an okonomia stewardship which is into Aenei, which is that which is to be, which is into the praise of the glory of him, which is into Apolutrosis, fully redeemed in day eight, which is into the praise of the glory of him. And so the point I'm making to you is all these things that are into refer to the bride of Christ. And that's who he's talking about. So when he says into, he's referring to the bride, all these are. So these people here, as we know, these folks here, these folks here, and bo both of these people, they enter the heavens. We know that. But we know that these people here, the 60 fruit people, are the ones that are, have a, you have the wise and the faithful among them. These people here have some that become wise, but you also have a lot of foolish here. So when he's talking about the into people, he gets specific onto this group, and he's talking about the wise and faithful people, the ones who are bridal maidens or are betrothed to be the bride. These people here that enter the heavens of this category, the specific one, are placed into, into, into. So if you see an into, He's referring to that group right there. He's not referring to this one. He's just not. So, and when you look at that, it's interesting to, to see. So, when you see this group here, they're generally in view, and there's an opportunity for them to, who have entered the heavens, are going to see one phrase where he does include them. I'm going to show it to you here in Ephesians. Go over to Ephesians and uh Let's see here what verse it is. I'm going to look, look to and show you. And it's over in, so I'm going to compare my eyes to the left, to the right. It is over in verse 13 when he says, about whom you also, that, that phrasing on the right side, on the left side in the Greek, and it says, in whom also you having heard the word of the truth, that word you, there's a general usage there, and so he doesn't specify the himan or himas, but he does pretty soon. So he says you that are, basically that word for you is more like the he has, the, the you who is present. Having heard the word of the truth, the glad tidings of the salvation of you, the himan. Because the salvation that's offered, so in other words, he's talking about in verse 13, is the salvation to become part of the bride is offered here amongst the people that are of 30 fruit and up. Anybody who enters the heavens has the opportunity, who is given a garment in the Ariston, to have the ability to partake in the verse 13 statement of the glad tidings of the salvation of you, meaning only those in the heavens have the good news of a salvation, of the salvation that's available to them, which is to be part of the bride for day eight. It's not that they're going to have it, but they have a chance in that situation. But if you notice, he doesn't say in two, he says in whom also. Not into whom in verse 13, but in whom. 
So when he refers to in whom, he's referring to the larger group of those who entered the heavens. Sometimes a specific group, but he goes both ways on that one. But when he refers to in two, he's referring to, again, this specific group here of the 60 fruit and 100 fruit people. So which are the wise and the faithful ones. So I'll put that in the board here too so you can know. All right, so, so as you're continuing to, to go back now, I wanna, so if, as you're reading that, then after that he has another bunch of ends. But let me just go through the, the scripture again to read this to you. So pick it up in Ephesians chapter one. And if you were to look at into again, verse one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, through God's will, or again, through, that is via means of, the will of God. So right there, so much for free will. He doesn't say, I chose Christ. He makes it very clear that I was made an apostle because that is what God's will in time, the thematos, the, th the, th th the, 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 can't even speak, the lematos, because thelema means thelo is executive will. Thelema, the ma at the end, means as a result of or in time. And the tos at the end is just the, as, the, as a of him. So basically the, the, the will and time of him. So it's referring to of, of him. So that's why he, he says, again, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ through, by means of, the will of God in time. So it didn't seem like, you know, he had a choice to say on October 1st of whatever he was going to choose. No, that's insanity. But people always teach that stuff. Oh, I believe, I don't believe in fate. I have my own control of my destiny. Well, I don't believe that at all because it's not true. So, now the illusion of that can be with time and emotions can trick you to think that, but it's not true. So then he goes and he says also, once he defines who he is, he starts off with the will of God is what made him who he is. Now, why would he do that to a people he spent the most amount of time with? Think about it. The most amount of time he spent there, three years, he was known by, by them more than any other as being their professor almost like he took the place of Gamaliel as the doctor of the law, but not just the law, of this new understanding. That's why he called it my gospel, right? So he is a dominantly respected, re highly regarded figure, and he wants to make it clear it's not about him. He wants to make it clear he didn't do something that earned the right to be at this state. So that would be a lesson to teachers like myself. Don't go pat yourself on the back and say, look at my book, look at my pedigree, look at my, you know, no. That's not what Paul did. Paul goes right before he speaks and says, I'm here because God put me here. Okay, now, now, let's, now let's go on to the conversation. Whoa. Puts, him, puts his own self in perspective. Just a servant, my friends. Just a servant. Howard Hendricks, the teacher at Dallas Seminary, used to say a teacher is a student among students. That's all he is. That's all he or she is supposed to be. So you don't look yourself more highly than you ought. So he goes in there and he says, to those saints, or to the saints, or tois agios, now look what he says, to those, he goes again, tois, being in Ephesus. So in other words, there's many tois agios. You see this? Another evidence of why people say, well, Ephesians was not written just to a particular four-walled place in Ephesus. Because he says, tois agios, to those. In other words, those there in Ephesus. So of the tois agios, those specifically in Ephesus. Because again, on the map, as you remember, it's a it's a, there's places that came out of Ephesus around the region uh, from Ephesus. I'm not going to just go to the board, but it's okay. But the reality is Tois Agios are the people in the region of Ephesus area because they were church planting. But of the Tois Agios, those there in Ephesus and to the believers. Now you may say it doesn't say the believers, but the way the grammatical structure of the word believers is, it, it's grammatically the ois is supposed to represent the believers. So it's supposed to have the article, the believers there. So even to the believers in Christ. Favor to you and peace, or that again, kiris, so grace, God's will to you and peace from God the Father of us. Now he says of us, and that's himon. That's all of us. Then it goes on, it says, and the Lord, and Lord Jesus Christ, and he, so he says, the Father of us and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 3, he says, worthy or blessed 
or that's the word, it's interesting because we get the word eulogy from this. It's the word eulogio, which just means bless. So if someone does a eulogy for someone who's passed away, you give a blessing, right? You have a blessing, which is why I don't want to digress too much. That's why I just can't stand funerals when somebody wants to give a salvation message when a eulogy by definition is supposed to be a blessing of how God has blessed that person's life. So we just stop with the high, high end aspect of trying to use it as a platform for your agenda and talk about the person. That life, once that day comes and goes, is now from that point forward in the rear view mirror. The least you could do as a person giving a eulogy for crying out loud is to talk about the person's life, accomplishments, how God used them and how God worked in and through them to do things because a lot of people don't know in that room, right? And I can't stand it. I go to funerals and they talk about this much about the person. They give this whole gospel message. I'm like, really? <laughs> I don't know the person. But a eulogy is supposed to be a blessing. So you're supposed to be, a ble you're supposed to be blessing the crowd with the, with the evidence of how God used that, that soul. How could you not do that? So anyway, it's my, my personal beef. But anyway, so he says, blessed be that God. Or again, eulogio. Blessed be that God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so... Interesting enough, this is Paul's eulogy, in other words. Paul's giving you the blessing. He's defining how Christ is because of his benefit, because of his life and death and resurrection, how he is benefiting you and me. He's giving you, he's giving you a eulogy, basically. He's giving you the blessing of, of Christ's life and death and resurrection and what it means to us. He's giving you the blessing or the eulogy. He's, he's giving you the, the, the understanding of, okay, okay, God, I don't think you understand what, what just happened a couple years back. Because I didn't understand it myself. I was persecuting folk, and I got knocked off my keister, and then I got told that I'm persecuting Jesus. And I'm like, well, what? And everything changed for me. So let me explain to you what I got explained to me when I got knocked off my keister, and then later on I got taught for three years by God himself, Christ is right in front of me. I kind of know some stuff. So let me, let, me, let me share with you some information here. So he goes in, and he says, Blessed be that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, Again, blessed us beyond, so it's the same, so it's the word for worthy there, you can look at it and look at the word for having blessed us. Very same, same word, different ending. It's a different suffix, same word. Again, eulogio, who has blessed us. Now look at the us. The word now is himas. So he talks, he's addressing everybody, but now he's speaking to the crowd who knows the ones he's taught for two years in Tyrannus. He's speaking to those people, the ones who were his students. He had many disciples, if you will, that followed him and that, that listened to him. But he had two years of really intense students who signed on for class. <laughs> you know, all right? So he says, again, the, the himas, you see that in verse 3. So the verse 3, left side of your margin, again, he says, having blessed us, and then he goes on and says, with or in every blessing spiritual. That's where this comes in. And in blessings, every blessing. But where are those blessings? In the heavenlies. And where is that? In Christ. And, and, and why is that? Because we're chosen in him. Oh, my goodness. And, and how is that? In love, preordained. Goodness gracious. He's giving you the blessing, the eulogy, how God in Christ, because of his life, death, and resurrection, has benefited you and me. It's, it's, it's really, wow. It's almost, imagine, imagine Paul at, there's not really a funeral because Christ didn't stay dead, so there's no such thing, right? <laughs> so he, he's alive, so, but imagine Paul giving a eulogy for Christ. He's telling you, let me tell you about what he did. Let me tell you about who he is and what he needs to be understood. For those who taught, who, who I taught specifically, he was a huge blessing to you. So he goes into that, he talks about that, having blessed those, the himas, those he taught specifically, he blessed them in every spiritual blessing, spiritual, in the heavenlies, and anointed, verse 4, even as. Now here's the crazy part. The word even as is the word kathos. So the word kathos is, is the word even as. And it means in the same way. So he says, so he blessed you in all these things, and he said, even as, or in the same way, he chose us in him before. So wait, wait, wait. So what he's telling you is, the reason that you have 
you have, you, he, he blessed you in spiritual blessings. He blessed you in the heavenlies in Christ, chosen in him. And, and he's about to tell you in, in love. The reason he, he's telling you this is because he said it's in the same way he did all those things is, is that he says the same way he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to have, which is a future tense, to what that which is to be, uh, so there's my eye, us, for us to have, there's the himos again, holy ones, and amomos, which is the blameless title giving to the bride in day eight, in his sight, which is catanopian, which is an individual view God has of us, of him. And then he says, in love. That's where your in love comes in, preordained. He says, in love again, in verse five, in love, my eyes just previously marked out. So he's telling you that in the same way that he put us in spiritual blessings and heavenlies in Christ, that was done in the same way as he marked us out, which was therefore both done before the foundation of the world, which means you had nothing to do with it. Zero. A big fat goose egg. Nothing. You can't say, well, God, no, what? No, no. See, God, see, he, well, you see, he, okay, okay, so he, okay, so he rolled it down on the road, and he saw where he was going to go, and so he chose me. No. Before anything at all happened, he said, in the same way, before the world was founded, he did the ba 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 ba. In the same way, he blessed you in spiritual blessings and heavenlies and Christ and him and love, which means you had zero to do with it. Not that you are, what you would be, what you would become, what you could offer. None of that mattered. None of that has anything. By the way, if it did matter, what, you, what do you have to offer being a sinner conceived in sin? Disgusting irrepute? Wow, it's a lot to offer God. Well, he, he can, who he likes that. No, don't, be, come on, think, think. Nothing you offer him, zero, right? So, so with that being said, it's interesting when he says even as or cathos in the same way, and I never caught that before because he puts forth all these things we're in, but he says cathos, same, in the same way he chose us. Well, how did he choose us, Paul? Well, he chose not just us, he's talking about the us, he's talking about the specific us who've been given these huge blessings of being in this bridal situation of at least a maiden or above, a 60 fruit person or above. And he goes into saying, well, and basically given wisdom and faith, and given the title of being a wise virgin or a faithful virgin, right, in that sense. So, so when you look at these things, he says, in him, chosen him before a casting down of the world, or the, ca the casting down, catabola, or that means a, a founding of, right? A casting of a foundation of the world. That's why it's some translation that says foundation. It's the correct translation because it means catabola, that which is emphatically laid down, which is a understanding of a foundation. So, so a casting down of the world to be us, this is the himas again, the specific us, holy ones and amomos, again, the bridal titling for blameless ones, in the sight or catanopian, which is the individual view God has of us individually of him. But how is that, Paul? In the same way all that happened, but he continues on. Here's his run-on sentences he does. Verse 5, in love, which is agape, having previously marked us out. Who, who did he mark out previously? The himas. So there he goes again. So he's talking about in the same way. So if you enter the heavens, why is he bringing this up? Because he wants Ephesus to know. Yes, I've been there for three years. Yes, I love you all. Some of you may go, yeah, but, but you taught them for two years in Tyrannus, and I only heard from you uh, differently over here in a group setting. I didn't get that one-on-one -on -one regimented training they got. I'm jealous. You know, like people in Corinth did when they said, oh, I got Apollos, and I got Paul. And Paul said, yeah, 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 guys, listen. Apollos may plant, and I may water, but God causes all things to grow. Stop getting drawn up in this whole stuff. You are who you are because God has you where you are, just like I'm who, I'm who I am, Paul would say. But he wants people to realize, he wants the he wants to realize, the us to realize that he is saying to them that us, the us here, those of us who are in that specific situation who entered the heavens, you entered the heavens in such a way where now you've been marked out to have this blessing of, of wisdom, of knowledge, of fruit bearing, that you're in a better position to be of the betrothed bride and to experience to be called the bride. 
In love he did all this. He marked us out. That word, I love this, the word here. That it says in verse 5, in love having previously marked us out. And the word there is prorizo, which means preordained. The word pros means beforehand, and orizio means to ordain, so preordained. I love when people always say to me, again, like, you know, <clears throat> some people used to teach, and many people teach today, when you go to heaven, it's going to say, chosen in him before the foundation of the world, preordained. And you walk through the gate, and you look by the other side, and it says, and I chose him too. Really? People teach that stuff. And I'm like, are you insane? That, that, but they teach that. And I'm thinking, uh, bro, that's, that's, just, that's just their way of justifying it, and it's not the way it works at all. He chose us. Paul makes that extremely clear about himself and then about us, including himself in that group. Then he goes on in verse 5, and he says that he, he did all this, marked us out in love in verse 5, left side of your margin. In love, he marked us out into, there's this word, sonship. Heruthesia, which is, again, the word for adoption. You say, well, what, what do you mean adopts us? Why would, what? Because we're not sons now. We're not sons now. He's, he's looking to adopt us in a future tense. He imputes to us an inheritance now. He imputes to us an adopt and a sonship now. But we don't experience that fullness of that until the beginning of day seven. For some people, they experience it, and the earthly ones get, the, the people on earth get an inheritance. People in the heavens get an entrance to await their inheritance, which, by the way, it's going to talk about that in Ephesians. I'm going to show you later on the verses, the latter on inheritance. But he speaks here about how we are into a sonship. So, therefore, this is something that we are, in, we are adopted into. Are we also in the praise of the glory of him right now? No. Just like we're not sons right now. We're into. He did all this in. These things he put us in was for the purpose later on to put us into. This is not right now, because he even says later on, if you, again, if you paid attention to how Paul wrote, up in verse 4, he said, uh, before the foundation of the world, to, to have, that word is again, an I, E-N-N-A-I, this word, he, he says, E-I-N-A-I, -I. oh, actually, it's right, I put it on the board, actually, right somewhere, I just saw, yeah, right here. I have to put it here. I put it right here already. An I, that which is to be, a future tense. That's also, that's also what Paul's talking about. So we're into things. He's put us into things that won't be manifested till later. Just like right now. Remember how God says in Revelation, I'm going to blot you out of the book of life? That means your name's already there. Are you experiencing uh, inheritance now? No. But that's why you can be erased, right? Because you're put in there for the purpose of experiencing it or not. So now he goes into, if you look in verse 5, again, going back, and he said, the marked us out for sonship through Jesus Christ. So he marked us out into sonship or into heruthesia, adoption, into adoption through or by the means of Jesus Christ into himself. So you're going, wait, 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 what are we adopted into? Into him. How are you adopted into him? What is that supposed to mean in the future? He's talking about becoming one with the bridegroom as the bride. He's talking about being brought into Christ by the means of Christ. So if it wasn't for what he did, you could not be into him in a way that's endearing, that like he's pointing out, which is why he says later on, into the praise of his glory. As we continue to read, he says that he says this again. He says, uh, this is done according to the good pleasure of the will of himself into a praise of glory of the favor of himself. Now, I'm going to look at later on the word according to because it happened six times. In the chapter one, Paul says six times the phrasing according to. And I'm going to, oh my goodness, show you what that means. And that's also like, wow, it's pretty awesome how what God has done and is doing. And, and just, wow, explaining to you and me how he has helped us, how he has blessed us. This eulogy, if you will, eulogio, that Paul is giving this blessing, how we're blessed by God. He's giving you the takeaways of a life that was not just well lived in the life and death and re resurrection of Christ, but what it has benefited you and me, because not just anybody just did this. God himself just did this, and the person of God the Son, Jesus, Yahshua, HaMashiach. Wow. Yowza. So he, he's giving you this like huge emphasis of not just what he's done, but who he is 
and what he's done equals this to you. Okay? So who he is is as is, is unbelievable as it is. It's, it's wow. And then you look at what he's done. Woo. Then, it, then, he, then he goes, oh, by the way, he gives this to you. Say what? That, that's crazy. So, so now he, he's looking at all this, and he's, and he's doing these things of explaining this. In verse 5, he said, again, into the, here, into the adoption or the sonship by the means of Christ into himself. So the adoption or the sonship is into Christ Jesus, into Jesus Christ, it's just into himself, according to the good pleasure, or again, that word is eudukia, which means what seems beneficial to God, his good will and pleasure, whatever seems beneficial to him, that's what it's according to, of his will. Whatever his will in time, he, think, he feels beneficial, that, that's, that's what he did. So it doesn't seem like it was based upon you, it's based upon him. He didn't say, I chose you to be on my team because you offered the ability to, no, 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 no. I, I, it was beneficial to me, and that's why I did it. But why, God? I just, I, I liked it. I like the idea of putting you on my team. I like the idea of, of putting you at this level. But why? It benefits me. But how? It, it just does. It's like, okay, thanks. I appreciate that. So he, and he goes into saying, and but what happens is when he does that, he says, in two, in verse six, the praise of the glory of the favor of himself. So it's in two, the praise. So the people that are the himas have not in the same in the same way in the epho and the kathos way in the same way God has beforehand put us in these beneficial things he has also put us into adoption into the praise of his glory unbelievable right into that of himself in verse 6 in which this says with but the word is in with in which he favored us the word favored us means perisiu P-E-R-I-S-S-E-U-O. It means abundantly, excessively lavished. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. So he is, so, so he is, so he is into the praise of the glory of favor of himself, in which, because of the into the praise of the glory of himself, because of that praise of the glory of himself, in that he richly be, it favors us. Well, no kidding. If you're made the bride in the praise of the glory of him. Well, no doubt you're abundantly, excessively lavished upon. How could you not be? You just got to the highest level you could possibly be at in Christ. He has brought you into himself. Wow. As saying, not just, not just, you're not just in Christ, covered by my blood, but you are my consummated bride. We, you and me, we're here forever. That is a abundant, excessive lavishing. No doubt about it. That is a perisiu. So then Paul goes on the right, and he says, In the one having been beloved. So he tells us again, the praise of the glory of himself, in which he favored us, or highly, again, parisio, highly abundantly, excessively lavished upon us, the himas, the specific us, in the one having been beloved. You, what, what do you mean, the one having been beloved? Y you know, the one from Matthew 3, when he got baptized and you heard the voice, or at least some did, others heard thunderings, when he said, Behold, my beloved son. You, you, you're what? My beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Or how about the Mount of Transfiguration? Later on, when, when some, hold, some heard again thunderings and, and others heard him say the same thing when they saw Elijah and Moses, and they saw him transfigured, and he said, Behold, my beloved son. So both when he was baptized and he was transfigured, when he began his ministry, and he was showing the future end game of the ministry, being coming back in his glory, both times the heavens spoke and said, this is the beloved one. This is he. So here you have, right now, the Apostle Paul being moved by the Holy Spirit to write to us. That is by, we were into the praise of the glory of himself in verse 6, in which he favored us, because of that praise of the glory, he favored us lavishly, abundantly, in, in himself, basically, the one having been beloved. <laughs> in whom, in verse 7, in whom we have, here we go, we have the apolutrosis. He says, the apolutrosis, which is speaking about again, the apolutrosis, which is the full redemption of day 8. 
you're into that as well. Through, he says, through the blood of him, through the blood of him, the forgiveness of the faults. Now, this part here, remember the, the uh, forgiveness means, again, to be pardoned and released. We have the pardon release, the aphesis. But then again, people would say everybody does, right? Well, you know, there's a beam of seat for a reason. Right? We all have to give account for our sins, for the, the things done good, good or bad done in the body. It says that. Then he goes on and he says, of the faults. And that word for faults is paraptoma, which is the word for falling away or fall away. Paraptoma. But interesting enough, he says it again, in whom we have the redemption through the blood of him, the forgiveness of the parapoptoma. I contend to you that this is a reference to the fact of the precious faith promise of which the faithful ones, specifically those who obtain the bridal betrothing title, they have a specific of the hemoths, of the 60 and 100 fruit, the 100 fruit people, the faithful ones, as a betrothed, get the precious faith promise, and they are having, they are pardoned and released from all aspects of being able to fall away. They have no ability to have an offense. We know that. And that's why they have no problem with their garment and the Ariston going to the Dyphnon. They're going to be lily white and pure. They're fine. That's why you want to get to 100 fruit, man. And then, then, then it's, you're good. You're, you're, you're good. But if you're 60 and under, then you got some work to do still. So if you're 100 fruit, you still got work to do, but you're you're preserved in that state of not having, you have this apolutrosis through the blood of him, the release and the pardon of these paraptoma. Because the context, again, people, would, people always apply this to the right here and now, but Paul's talking about a future tense going back up to verse 4, and plus we know that because of his referencing to what we are brought into a praise of his glory. We don't have a praise of his glory yet. We're not a glorified body. I don't have that. We're not sons yet. We're not adopted yet as sons in him. Not the way he's describing himself in the beloved, no. So then he says, according. And there he goes again with that word according. According to the wealth of the favor of him. And the word for wealth there is plautos, P-L-O-U-T-O-S. I put it on the board here. It means abundant wealth. So people used to joke and say, what's the difference between being rich and being wealthy? Well, a wealthy person writes the rich person's check. That, that's the difference. <laughs> so between rich and wealthy, people can be rich, but if you're wealthy, you're writing a check for the person who's rich, okay? So wealthy and, or beyond measure, that's God. So you can be rich in spiritual blessings, but the only reason you're rich is because the wealth came from God. That's why God says in the Bible, all wealth comes from Him. All. It's kind of a head scratcher, by the way. Those who, who use it unwisely or just evilly, God's given it to them for His own purposes and means and, and reasons. I don't tend to even think to understand why, but he does. Then he says also, he says here also in, in, in verse 8, um, you know, does he, according to the wealth of the, or the, again, abundant wealth of the favor of the charistos, so he has abundant wealth of his executive desire to do whatever he wants, that's his grace, that's charistos, that's the favor, the favor is God's grace, and it's God's grace, the power and the right and the might do whatever he wants when he wants. He has a lot of wealth in that area, no, no doubt. Of him, which he caused to abound, there's your word, perisio, excessively and abundantly, he, okay, tore into us, into, there it goes again, the, the himas again, the us, the himas, into us. In all, but in what way, Paul says, did he do that? Well, it's, it's, it's manifested in all wisdom. The word wisdom, Sophia. The ability, Sophia is the summation of being able to have a clarity skill. You can bring, you have a skill for clarity and understanding things very easily. You know, when someone takes a complex thing and then puts it into a simple word story or a simple statement, and you go, oh, you're wise. Because they made the complex simple. It's a skill. Sophia is a, is, a, is a skill for those who take the knowledge of the circumstance or situation or the Word of God and can make it clear. It's a skill set. So, and he says intelligence. 
So not only did he bless us, how does it manifest himself? Uh, how does it manifest itself? How he's abundantly, excessively lavish people in him. Now, does this refer to everybody, everybody in Christ? Does everybody in Christ that you know have ability to bring clarity as a skill? Really? Do they? Using the word of God. They do. Yeah, right. We all know they don't. We got some people that are teaching that don't. Then he goes into and he says, the other word for knowledge is the word phronesis, which is mindset. Right here. Phronesis. So does he not only does he have this abundant, excessive lavishing towards us and all Sophia, clarity, a clarity skill to make things clear and the word of God and through life, but also in our phronesis, phronesis, which is our ability to have a, the right mindset. So you say, what do you mean right mindset? In other words, seeing the word of God for what it is, truth within truth, scripture within scripture, layer upon layer, truth within truth, constantly unveiling itself. So these two things, as we know, to prove right there, people say, well, this is referring to everybody in Christ. It, it does? Okay. So you're telling me that everybody in Christ has the ability to have a, have a, have a skill set to make things clear in the word of God. Everybody does. Who's in Christ? Everybody? Everybody in Christ has the ability to have the right mindset of having the right lens to approach Scripture with that details matter and that God uses different grammatical structures to speak to different people and speak to different situations. And they understand the mindset of the dispensations, of the times and places, and of the detail. They, they may not understand all the nuances, but they understand the, the, the format that that's how God speaks. They, they understand that? That there's different kinds of calls and inheritances? They understand that, really. There's more than one salvation. They understand that. I don't think so. So there's no way they do. So point in reference that this is referring to not just anybody in Christ, but to the Hamas. I don't want to say that the wrong way. It sounds like I'm talking about the Muslim group. The Hamas, the actual uh, word in the, the Greek language. H-E-M-A-S. So, so then he, he goes into this whole process later on in verse 9, and he says, Having made known, or norizia, which is, again, to, to make known to us the secret, the mysterion, the will of himself. So, again, the reason why they have this Sophia and this phronesis is because he has made known to them the secret of the will of himself. So he clarifies what he means by the, the clarity skill set and the right mindset. It's the right clarity skill set and mindset within being given the secret of himself. So for those who think I'm making stuff up, you just keep reading and you go, oh, okay. He tells you what it refers to. Not what you think it means, what he tells you it means. Not what churchianity has defined it as being, what the word of God defined it as being. So again, he goes on to say, in verse 9, according to, or there's that word again, kata, according to, the same thing again, the good pleasure of himself, which he before purposed in himself. That is the word, prothith, pr right here, I put it right here, prothithimi, which he set beforehand. So many folks want to tell me things like, well, when he spoke to Jeremiah and he says, I knew you in the womb and I loved you beforehand, what Jesus meant is that he knew beforehand what he would do and what he would become. And so he took Jeremiah. Really? Really? No. So what he says here, he says, his good will and pleasure was set beforehand. So it was already set beforehand. The reason why it benefit, reason why he thinks it benefits him, the reason why he thinks it's good to him, the reason why God thinks it just makes him happy is because beforehand he decided so. Based on what? Based on himself. No. Y yes. Based on himself. Not based on time and emotions and malarkey and later on stuff that would come to pass. No, no, no. Based on himself. It's hard for us to understand that because think about something. When I was once long ago in seminary, we had this conversation about, about what, what love is. And if anybody really is, is, is able to love in any capacity, and we had this conversation, and I said, think about it. everything that we, everything you do, you're selfish. No matter who you claim you love, you actually do it for a selfish motive. You, you do. All of us do. None of us can love altruistically. You, you, I mean, as in meaning love without wanting or needing anything in return. Really? Stop lying to yourself. 
All of us do that. All of us love wanting or needing something in return. All of us do. He said, no, I love my spouse unconditionally. I love my kids and my grandkids. Stop lying. I, I know you mean to in a sinful body, and as do, as do I, but the reality is all of us and our subconscious mind want to have that love returned, need to have that love returned. You think that's not true? Try it sometime. Then if, that, if it's not true, then why don't you just, why, why did Jesus say, you've heard it said, love those that love you, but love those that hate you. Uh-huh. Why do he say that? Because it's not normal. Because they're not giving you what you want and need. They're giving you hatred. So that's why he said, do that which is abnormal. How can you do that? Only when he inside you is able to do that. So what he's telling you is, you can't do that. You don't want to do that. Who does? He's telling, I'm not making this up. He's telling you, we suck. We can't love the way that he loves. We can't. He goes, if, if you could, then he wouldn't, we wouldn't need him. He says, that's why God is love. He goes, listen, I don't want your love. I don't need your love. I just, I, but I do want, and I do want to love you. And because he, he's so much a loving character as trait, he needs to exhibit that love. So he just, he needs to express his own character and he wants to do that. So he does that to us. But does he want and need it back from us? Nope. He wants us to figure out that we should want that back to give it back to him. But he just says, no, I don't, I don't need it back. I don't, I don't want it back in this sense of, you know, I, I'm looking for it. No, no, no. I, it should be something that you want to give back to me. You should, given the fact why he gave it to you to begin with was came from himself with nothing in return. He wanted nothing in return, zero. It's just amazing. Now he requires things, but that's about it. We okay back there, babe? Yeah, it just pops up every so often. Okay, all right. Let me make sure we're good. So it's just very interesting how, how God does this. So he goes, according to his good will and pleasure. So in verse uh, 9, later on, the very part, the, the bottom of your diglot, the verse chapter there in Ephesians, according to the good will and pleasure of himself, which he beforehand, or again, prothethemi. So beforehand, he already established what was pleasing to him. And himself, according to what people would say, no, according to time and what you saw, no, according to himself, based on himself, based on himself, what made him happy, what he felt was beneficial, based on himself, beforehand, he set this in, in motion, okay? So it's really clear, had zero to do with creation at all, mankind, time, none of that is relevant, just God and himself, in and of himself, no counselor said, this is what I want to do, and this is why I'm doing it, because I did it, because I myself did it for that reason only, because I just wanted to. Verse 10, but for what reason did he do this to bring us, the, the himas, the ones who were in this 1600 fruit people, look what he says in verse 10, into an okonomia, which is on the board here somewhere, I put it here, I have it here somewhere, I know I wrote it down, there's right here. And to an okonomia, a stewardship. That's the word okonomia, a stewardship. And we all know you can only be a steward when you're in the ability to at least give forth some teaching. The true stewards are the 100 fruit people. Some 60 fruit are stewards also at a lower level. But you cannot be a steward unless you're of 60 fruit minimum and then 100 fruit ideally. That's where it works. So you can't see here, the stewards specifically are the hundred fruit, but there are some 60 fruit that are included because they're in a progressing fashion of moving up. You do see that in some occasions. But again, okonomia is a stewardship word which refers to, obviously, again, if those who have the right mindset, the phronesius, they know that's not referring to this anybody in Christ. That's referring to a specific group, which is the himas he's talking to, the us of the agios saints. That's the verse 10 and to the okonomia of the fullness so what are your stewardships over i love this watch he clarifies what he means i love it he goes of the stewardship of what of the fullness of the plural of the pleroma p-l-e-r-o-m-a the pleroma or we get our word plethora from that right which means the many facets of what of the seasons <laughs> Of the sea, as in keros. That's the word for seasons. Okay, wait a minute. There are many, okay, so the, the, so the aggregate reality of the seasons, to re, for what reason? To reduce under one head. Or the word there is used only one time in the entire scripture. And it's the word 
anek kefalao, and it means the aggregate sum, to sum up. In other words, to summarize. In other words, when you first, if anybody in our congregation took physics or calculus or any course, I don't care if it's world history, English literature, whatever it is that you took a course on where you know, honestly, you went into it going, I want to learn this, but I don't, I, don't, I don't really have a working knowledge. I have kind of a cursory view of this that excites me and I'm interested in it, but I, I want to learn some depth here, right? And, and when you go in a class like that, it always excites you because you learn, you already, ex you want to learn, now you're kind of like building on that. And I, like I remember telling you guys when we went to DC, when we went to the National Archive Museum, when I saw the, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, I didn't know how I was going to react, but I, but I cried. It overwhelmed me with just the reality of that, oh my goodness, God moved these men to, to wow, it's just like this country stands today because of what they wrote then, and it's the original paper, it's just, wow. So just imagine you're in a class, you want to learn, could you stand up for everybody and give a summary of a complex subject? Aerodynamics. Could you get up and say to the people at Boeing, let me, let me teach the class today, here's a summary overview, we're going to discuss the next 52 weeks. Okay, could you do that? Yeah, right. I can't. <laughs> There's no way I'm doing that. So when, when he's saying a stewardship, a, a okonomia of the fullness of the seasons to reduce under one head to anakafalao, he's telling you by default, no kidding, a steward has to be the person doing this. Who else can give you a summary overview of what God is saying in his word through the seasons? Are you insane? A person in Christ is going to do that? A regular, a regular person. Harry, Susie, Sally Q is going to go, I can do it all. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. There's no way. Isn't that you're dumb? You're not. You're just not there yet. We all start somewhere. Is a baby dumb? No, they're a baby. A baby can't go, I'm like playing to use the universe. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. You're only zero. So nice try. So you can't be, you know, even, was it Mozart was a, was a teenager or something like that? There are savants, granted. Paul was one of those spiritual savants. So there are stewards, okonomia, people that have stewardship that are savants that are before their time, like Paul, and there's those that are normalcy that grow through time. But the reality is only persons given this okonomia can give the summary view of the fullness of the seasons. Otherwise, how could you? How could you possibly summarize for me the depth and width and height and length of this book? This is just the New Testament. Of the, of the scripture, Old and New Testament. How are you going to give me the, the summary of this when you don't even know anything yet because you just got to be in Christ yesterday? Or you've been in Christ for maybe two months, two weeks. How? Or you've been in Christ for 10 years, but you don't really spend time in the Word of God. How are you going to give me that to me? How are you going to give me a summary? How are you going to be able to give me the fullness of the times? How are you going to be able to fit the description of a steward? How? There's no way possible. No way. So those who would argue, well, this guy's parsing words, Ephesians speaking, everybody in Christ, everybody in Christ. Look at your own evidence of your life, my friends. Ask your friends, ask your neighbors, ask people that you know in your life. Can just anybody be called a steward if, in fact, a steward is a person who gives you the fullness of the seasons and a summary view? I have it all summed up for you. Can they do that? No. So therefore, it doesn't refer to everybody. Pretty simple. So he goes into saying, uh, and under one head, so in verse 10, to reduce under one head, the things all, not, he tells you what he's summarizing, the things all in the anointed, the things in the heavens, and the things upon the earth in him. So he's defining what he's summarizing, by the way, what he's, what he's reducing down under, under one. He's summarizing all the things in, in Christ, all, not some, all the things in Christ, which means all the spiritual truth, and in the heavens, and the things upon the earth, in him. So that means they understand the difference between the heaven and the earth, inheritance and entrance, and they understand the spiritual depth of what Christ, how he spoke and what he was speaking about. Just anybody can do that? No. The okonomia can. People are given stewardship can. And they're in charge to, yes. Vicki said it's also found in Romans 13, 9. Romans 13, 9. Hold on a second here. Are oh, you referring to the word? Hold on a second. Did I misspeak?
Oh, okay. It's it's similar. It's a very it's a little differently. That's and and click. Yeah, I remember, I remember seeing this. You can see the word is similar, but it's a little different in Ephesians. It's longer. It has other letters in there. I'm trying to figure out which it ones. Says being brought under one head. Yeah, the concept is definitely there, absolutely. But the word itself, it has it has a, it has the word brought under one head, but it actually has that word to reduce in there or to sum. So that's in there too, because I because if you look at this, enek e fala. Yeah, you're missing, you're missing that middle part. As soon as you get to the P-A-I, you have that W-O-A-O. -O. You're missing a W-O-A. It's a little different. It, it's it basically similar. It, it's, very, it, yeah, I'm a, it's a very similar word, but I, I, what I meant by that was the exact word itself. Lainey said, what is the word? Anaklep, <laughs> anak, anakfalao, anakfalao. So it's a large, it, so it's. Speak there, okay, but the idea is the same. Yeah, really. yeah, you're right, it's, uh, yeah, same idea. So I just meant the word itself and how it's used in that way. To give you an idea what I meant by that, I'm going to give you another example of what I mean by that. I didn't mean to confuse. I'm sorry if I did that. I didn't mean to do that. He said not meaning the challenge. No, no, no. No, you're fine. So this word here, this word here is different than the one in Romans, but it means similar stuff. Just like, for example, if you look over to what I mentioned before over in verse um, 6, when he says, the beloved one, that phrasing there for the beloved one is only here as well. Now, the word beloved does appear in other passages I mentioned earlier, Matthew 17, Matthew 3, transfiguration, baptism. But in that verse 6, it's agapemeno, which only appears in that particular tense. That's the right word. That's the, right, that's the thing I should have said. So the tense of this word is only used this way in Ephesians. That's a better way of saying it. So the tense of the beloved is in the same fashion used only this one way in Ephesians 6, Ephesians 1 verse 6, like no other place that use it like that to emphasize the beloved one. So they don't really have it that way in other passages. It's not written the same way. You can check it out. It's not written the same way. Same root word meaning, but the tense of it is different to emphasize or to change in some unique way to really bring out different aspect of who Christ, in this case, in Ephesians is, and the context, the, the blessings coming from and in Him. So going back to Ephesians in chapter 10, and I appreciate you bringing out the Romans uh, 13, 9 under one head. Um, and so it's to the, when they bring up the Romans, it's talking about some other words to bring everything. It's like a sum, a sum up under one head. So when you bring up the context of, because in that case, they're, they're bringing up into subjection, whereas in Ephesians, it's bringing it under, under the actual responsibility or accountability of the steward or the okonomia to, to equip. So a little, little different, one's in a subjection context and one's in a, in a, a responsibility context, context, which is why words are the same in understanding, but the text is a little different because the context is a little, little different, but same meaning in essence. So. When you have the really interesting part comes up in verse 11. Vicki said, I have a note that the seasons in verse 10 is of the day of the Lord. Is that correct? Well, the fullness of the seasons are the keros. If you look at your days of scripture chart, um, the seasons are leading up to day seven. So that would be fine because Jesus mentioned you should know the season of his coming. So the seasons always speak to the very first demarcation of day seven because day eight is after the first season has already come upon us, which is when he is going to come again. So kairos or seasons speaks to us being watchful for the season. So we would be vigilant to be standing watchful in the season in which he would come. And so yes, so season speaks to a 
preparatory aspect of being vigilant unto day seven. So, and on the Days of Scripture chart, you'll see at the bottom, I have those different words that they use for hour, day, uh, seasons, all mapped out for you on Days of Scripture chart. I don't know what number that is offhand. I think it's in the teens. Um, I'm going to say 14, guessing offhand. I can't remember. But, but it's in that part of it. But yes, so, so yes to that question. So then when you go through, and verse 11, after he says... I think he said 14. 14, that was close, see? <laughs> so, so, so the days, uh, and he says, in the administrate into the administration, okonomia, of the fullness of the seasons, to reduce under one head the things all in the anointed, the things in the heavens, the things upon the earth in him. Now, and he says, and whom... Now look at this now, this is awesome. So he's doing all this stewardship, so he's the chief steward, obviously, doing this, which he's in charge of other stewards, like the Apostle Paul, to carry on that ministry. But Christ is the steward who did all this, is what he's pointing out. Then he goes on to verse 11, he says, In whom also we obtained a portion. This is a very interesting word. So, the word here, as you can see, is it has the word clarinomian here, but there's an ek in front of it. It's the only time that I could find an ek in front of clarinomian, which is inheritance. That's why on the translation on the diglot it says obtained a portion, whereas on the right side it says obtained an inheritance. I'm here to tell you, here's your evidence of the fact that there is a second portion of an inheritance because he's talking about the ek clarinomian, which is the inheritance out of the original. In other words, if you have, if you have an ek in front of clarinomian, that means there's a, there's a portion. This is why the English translation is correct on the left side of your diglot. That's why it says portion because it knows it's referring to a piece out of a whole. So if there's an ek clarinomian, that means of a clarinomian inheritance, there's a one out of that. Say what? We know it as a first and second portion. We do. The first portion of the inheritance is on earth. Where's the second one? In the heavens. When? Day eight. Say what? So in verse 11, I've never seen it before. It's right there. We see ek anastasis as out resurrection. Of a resurrection is another one that comes out. Of an inheritance is another one that comes out. It tells you that in verse 11. In whom we also ek clarinomian. Again, out of. Well, Eve was out of with the second portion herself. Well, she was, yeah. She was. Yep. She was out of. She was called out. She was so Adam was called, she was called out. So she's the type of actually the, the people in the heavens, absolutely. So when you look at, I'll spell the word on the board for you. I'm not saying it 100%, right? But let me put it here for you. So in verse 11, it is E K. L E R O T H E M O N. Eclerothemon. Eclerothemon. So this ek, because when there's an E X in front of a K, when, when the word is, starts with a K, and there's an E X in front of it, in the actual spelling, you're going you're gonna to leave out the X because there's a K already there, so it's, it always says that. Yes? Tracy said, would this then be a good verse to explain to a newbie about two inheritances? Yes and no. Um, to a newbie, probably not, because they're not going to understand what you're saying. But it just gives, it, it, it is a reference point of supporting the idea that, that there is an inheritance that comes out of an inheritance. Just like in one in Ephesians chapter 3, there's a resurrection that comes out of a resurrection. So I wouldn't use it as a solid core aspect for someone who's new because they're not going to understand the nuances of language being important. But if it's a reason to give an answer for the reason for the hope that you have, um, they say, why do you believe such a, that doesn't make any sense? What do you base this on? And then you, can, you can say, you don't have to understand. It's okay. But I want you to know why I believe that, and this is why. So it's a verse I would use to validate and substantiate and confirm why we believe in an inheritance within an inheritance. I would go to that verse for that reason, to confirm, validate, justify, explain, um, you know, elaborate on why that is because the scripture says it 
in its own language. That, that's, why I would, that's how I would use it. A new person may or may not understand that. I don't know. She said, okay, thanks. That, good, good question, fair question. Well, but that, it seems within, always within, there's the outer court, the inner court, the holy of holies, the within, it's always getting yeah. to the within. Yeah, if you go, just to, just to go back to remind you, I mentioned the one in Philippians, but that's in Philippians chapter 3 when he says in the uh, verse 11, he says on the left side of the margin, it's the ex anastasis, it's the out resurrection. So it's the same understanding. So how interesting, it's easy to remember, by the way, the verse 11 is, the, is a consistency. So Ephesians 1.11, the ek clarinomian, and then you have the ex anastasis and Philippians 3.11. So they're both verse 11, <laughs> okay? So that may help you to understand. So it's, again, I'll put it on the board here. So it's, it's the... It's the, it's the, ah, I keep on putting the word out. Out of inheritance, which is the second portion, which is inherit the heavens. Versus, versus the earth, which is portion one. That gives you an idea. All right? So there he says that in verse 11. And he says, having been previously, so he says, and whom also we have been ek klerothamon, having been previously marked out. So, okay, there he goes again. He's telling you, well, how do you have this inheritance second portion? Did you, did you do anything to earn it? Nope. It's been previously marked out. You've been previously marked out. Where is on the board? I put it on the board here. Uh, the parizo, it's the same word again, from same as verse 5. It's the word parizo. It's been preordained. You've been preordained again. <laughs> so does God want us to obey? And absolutely. You know, you have to obey. You have to... So that, that's what he wants. That's the interesting God. So we want love back when we give love. God gives love. He wants obedience. <laughs> You're like, what? He doesn't want love back. He wants obedience back because that's how we show love to him. It's really weird because for us, love is more of a feeling and, a, and, a, and an emotion and, a, and a how we you know, can be made to feel. And we have these books on love languages of how people can touch us and speak to us and a, and a tone or what they do or don't do. It changes everything. God says, I'm not about that. I'm just about one. Just obey. Then I know you love me. That, that's, it, that's it? And he goes, yeah, but it's not easy. Try it. And you're like, no, it's not easy. So, so you have to obey to show God you love him. So that's why I meant before when I said God doesn't want our love. He wants our obedience. That's how he spells love, O-B-E-Y. I always tell that to the kids growing up. Oh, yeah. Well, it, I, I always talk about in the scripture where it, right before that it says uh, obey, obey each other out of fear of Christ. And I said, so if you are obeying each other out of fear of Christ, that means you're realizing who she is, who he is in Christ. And therefore, not, it's not about one listening to the other person. It's about each of you independently obeying Christ. And because of that, then it says, wives, obey your husbands. Well, that's because you've already obeyed each other out of fear of Christ. Well, no kidding. It's easy for her then to take her role to, to follow because you've already founded the relationship correctly on who's the real head. It's Christ. And now through him being the head, he's using you as the head to speak. Easy for women to obey to that. It's easy to submit to that. It says submit to each other first. And then you submit to your, to your husband. So it's really interesting out of fear of Christ because out of fear, he's gonna answer, you're going to answer to him. So and going back to this scripture here, it's interesting because he says again, he says, uh, having previously marked out according to the design. And this design is the prothesis. That's the beforehand determined, the prothesis. According to the prothesis. And I have it on the board here. Because according to, so he does all these things into, in and into, according to the prothesis, which I have right here, the design. And he goes into saying, he goes into saying also in verse 11, <clears throat> according to, I mean, to the things all operating according to the counsel of the will of himself. And, his, and the counsel of the will of himself is his decreed wisdom 
and his predisposition. So we have his predisposition of his decreed wisdom before time. So it's, it's like <laughs> according to his own predisposition, according to his own decreed wisdom. I mean, can, can, can God get any clearer that has nothing to do with you? I mean, I don't know how he can make it any clearer. In chapter 1 of Ephesians, he's making it so clear. It's, that's why people who are free willers, they hate chapter 1 of Ephesians. They hate it. It just slaps them in the face. Psh, wrong, wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. It's all over the place. God's saying it's me, it's all about me, it's all about me. Not, not me, I mean God. So he says here also in verse 12, in order, in two, he does all this, in two, in order, in two, that to be us into a praise. Oh my gosh. So he does this in order so that things that will be for us, the, the, the specific us, into a praise of the glory of him. Again, he says that. Those having been before hopers. What? In the Christ. Another eye opener. Say what? And he says, those having been the hopers. Look at that. Another interesting. These two verses are huge. And these two words. And the word for this, this says hopers on the left in your diglot. On the left side. But on the right side of verse 12, <coughs> it just says prior hope. The word there is pro el piso. And it means before. Pro means before. And el piso means be before to have hoped. Well, guess who he's talking about? That's right, you got it. Those who entered the heavens, which is everybody here, Paul's addressing in Ephesians, have all hoped. So what is Paul talking about? From those who already have hoped, who are in the heavens, that's why you're experiencing this, the, the hope, right? You, have, you before hoped. He's talking about how those people, in order to be us, for to a praise the glory of him, having before hoped in the anointed, and whom also, having heard the word of the truth, the glad tidings of the salvation of you. And the word you is Haman. So what he's saying is, of everybody who entered the heavens, of all of you who heard the good news of the salvation, day eight salvation of the bride of Christ, you had a before hope. You all have this hope in entering the heavens. And then out of that is where the extra inheritance comes from. I mean, how awesome are these two verses? He's telling you right there. If you just read it and understand the format which he's referring to, it's validation that, yes, you inherit first in the heavens, and then when you enter first, excuse me, then you inherit in the heavens. And he's telling you, if that wasn't the case, why would he say that this right here, that this comes out of those who before have hoped? What? He says, and how do you before have hoped? And he says, and he goes, in, this is equaling people that have, entered the heavens, whoops, sorry. You have entered the heavens. Then he even says, you have the glad tidings of the salvation. Which is, which is basically um, the bride. which is given in day seven. You're given that in day seven, right? You're given that. You're, you're being told, get your other fruit. That's the good news. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. <laughs> so move up, you know? So he says here in, in verse 11 and 12 that this is according to the counsel of the will in verse 11 of himself into that which is to be us, the us here, these people us, a praise and glory of himself, who having been before. So these people who were before enterers, because now they're going to be of the, the previous verse 11, the ek kleronomon, have an inheritance out of the inheritance, second portion, which is again going into the heavenlies as the bride. He says, in the anointed, in verse 13, in whom... Also, you having heard the word of the truth, the glad tidings 
of the salvation of you. Because they previously heard, heard, as the whole group heard, the salvation of the bride going in day seven. They, they already heard that. They know about the betrothed bride aspect, and they know the salvation they're looking forward to is in day eight. They know that. I mean, this is unbelievable. By the way, that's on your chart, the salvation. The glad tidings of salvation is the glad tidings given to people that are not the bride yet, but it's pertaining to being a part of, which is given in the heavens he's telling you here. So then he goes on and he says, in whom also, verse 13, having believed, you were sealed. And the word for sealed means to have been set upon, like a signet ring, uh, spargizio, with the spirit. So you were sealed with the spirit of the promise. Now the word promise is awesome because I want you to, so the word, so, so let me put this on the board here. So we have verse 13, or is it, mm, yeah, 13 and 14. So he says you're sealed, and that's your word there for spargizmo, dragizo, which is which is basically a a signet seal of the spirit. So what he's talking about is these people, when he says here. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the spirit of the promise in the holy, which is a pledge of the inheritance of us. Now, <clears throat> you were sealed with the spirit of the promise. So this right here, you're sealed. And the sealing means that only that, it's like, it's, a, it's the imagery of a king who puts his, in that wax, that emblem on the letter, and only the person who was intended for can crack it. You can't crack the seal. Only the person who put it there or the intended receiver. So he goes into saying, okay, and he talks more about this, and he says that you are the pledge, which is the, okay, the seal, lose my spirit, seal of the promise, excuse me, spirit of promise. The word promise is interesting because it's, it's the word that means, it's the word ap apologia. Ap I can't even say the word, apagelia, I said it wrong, apagelia. Apagelia, and it means to announce assurance. To announce assurance. of So you're sealed with the signal of the Spirit of a promise, which is to announce our assurance <coughs> of what? And he says, with our, and with the Holy, which is a pledge, okay, which is a pledge, which is the word Arabadon. Arabdon, I can't even say it right. Arabon, Arab, is that right? Arabon, yeah. Which is a down payment. So he says the Holy Spirit, the signet is a promise, an, an, annou an announced assurance, an announced assurance of which is a pledge, which is our rabbon, of a down payment. Of what? Of the inheritance of us. So, so this right here, the inheritance of us. So he's talking about, whoops. So right here, I can't even, let me see what I'm looking at here. Oh, if I can spell. And this word for us is the Haman. So he's using the Haman, which is the general um, people. All enter. All who enter the heavens, I should say, to put it simple. Okay, so he said on there in verse 13, ah, 
He said again, in whom also you have heard the word of the truth, the glad tidings of the salvation of you. Again, the salvation of which is the bride going in day seven for all those who entered the heavens of you, which is the general you, the, the Haman. Then he says in verse uh, 13 onward, in whom also having believed you were sealed, the sphagizo, the seal upon you, with the spirit of the promise, which is the announced assurance, the apologia, with the holy, which is, which is the pledge, the arabon, down payment of the kleronomia, which is the inheritance of us. So he tells you now of us. So he tells you of the us, which is the Haman. So in, in two, this is a pledge of all of us, in two, apolutrosis of the peripoesis. So in two, a praise of the glory of him. So go, so go stop. So what he's saying there is the two in twos are in two apolutrosis. You see that. And you see that in verse uh, 14. In two left side of your margin, in two apolutrosis of the peripoesis, which is the word possession, which is a gained possession. In two, it praise the glory of him. So the two and twos are on the basis of knowing that you've been given. So the seal of the spirit of the promise. So once you're in the heavens, he's announcing an assurance to you and giving you a down payment of the inheritance. So in other words, he gave you the garment for crying out loud. Remember, that's your pledge. That, that's, your, that's your announced assurance. I gave you a, I made the slate clean. There's no sin. There's no sin. He gives you a garment, and he gives you a down payment. Here's the garment. Keep it clean and make another one. Okay. For your inheritance. That's the down payment, the garment, for your inheritance. And all you got to do is do what you're supposed to do. Keep it clean and make another one. And if you do, then he says at the end of verse 14, you'll be able to be the part where he says now you're that purpose of that was to bring you into apolutrosis of the peripoesis, into the praise of the glory of him. Because if you don't, you'll be out of, not into. <laughs> it's not funny. So that's why this, so again, so he's talking about here, he's giving you th this pledge is this, this, is this wedding garment. And the Ariston. That's what that's talking about there. So he, because he's talking about people, because whenever you look at this whole context, Paul is not talking about a right now situation. He's talking about that which is in the future, because he keeps talking about things. Again, he starts off with again earlier in verse four, things that will be, and verse ten, the stewardship of everything being summed up. Then he goes into verse eleven, talking about inheritance that comes out of one. So all these put together help you understand. He's talking about a future sense of the people he's talking to in the Hemos, saying, guys. Of the, of the whole group, who we are, we should know better into what we've been given. We're being given that. You get to this station of where you're going to need to be, 100 fruit, you're going to be given this, this, you're going to be exempt, you're going to be fine. But the rest of us are going to be given this wedding garment as our pledge of the inheritance, the Holy Spirit, which is our pledge of the inheritance of us, which is the word himan, which is all of us who enter the heavens. He's our pledge. He's our down payment, which is a pledge. So, is there a question back there, babe? Uh, Lainey asked about the spelling of the word for pledge and Vicky, if you told her. So he's, he's talking about, again, this, this, this pledge of the inheritance of us. So it's interesting that we have, because if you think about it from the church here's what they're going to say. They're going to say, the Holy Spirit is a pledge that we all are heirs right now. And that's why they, if you, re if you read songs that they've written, in the modern day churchianity, if you see a movie or if you go to a common day sermon, you know as well as I do, they're going to call you right now sons and right now heirs. They are. But that's not true. You don't become an heir. Here's the thing. I, I, I la it's laughable. How can you be an heir when the one that you serve hasn't inherited his position yet? Explain that to me. How could you be greater than your master? How could he who is now acting as priest, who not yet has come as king and judge, 
How can he, who does not inherit the throne of his father David, who has not inherited his completion of his ministry, how can he, who is the cornerstone, the capstone, the author, the finisher, the everything of our faith, how can you, the creator God himself, God Almighty, Jesus Yeshua, how can he, who still be working, you have the audacity of the student as the subordinate, say you're higher than him? You get to inherit before he does? You're out of your mind. You call yourself an heir before he is? You're out of your mind. There's no way. There's no way. There's no way. That's not how it works. Yes. You know, people always teach that stuff, though. They'll say, well, you're an heir right now. No. I will go as far as to say this. You could be or may be in position to be an heir. That's correct. Just like Christ is in position to then next take on the office of king and judge. But is he there yet? No. Is he in position to? Yes. Will anything prevent him from doing that? No. But for us, we're in position to inherit, but we could disobey. We could backslide. We could say, forget all this. Well, that's, yeah, I wouldn't do that. But if you did that, well, then you're going to just be disinherited. But you could be in a position to be an heir, but you're not going to be an heir right now. That's insane. So when he's talking about this information here, when he says, pledge of the, pledge of the inheritance, Holy Spirit is a pledge of the inheritance, many believe that, that that means that when the Holy Spirit's inside of you, when you first come to know Christ, therefore they teach, this, what they, this is what they teach this means. He's inside of you, and therefore you're an heir. And they, they base it on this scripture right here. And, you, and, I, and I go, I scratch my head, and I go, what, 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 how? Based on what I just said, that's not possible. And they go, what's the alternative? Well, I'm telling you what the alternative is. Read what Paul is writing. He is not writing about the right now. He's talking about what has happened, no doubt about it, and what's going to happen in the future because of what Christ did. What's he talking about? In verse 3, what is Paul doing? He tells me, blessed be that God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Eulogio. He's giving you a eulogy. Again, a eulogy. A eulogy does what? It looks back at a person's life, and it looks forward to what we do now that person's gone. And remember the memories and the things that that person left behind for us to always remember, right? So now when you look at Christ, who lived and died and rose again from the dead, but through him gave all the blessings to us, Paul is writing about, let's talk about who he is and what he's done. And the first few verses, he did that, verses 1 to 9. Then he, he pivots and says, the okonomia of the fullness. And let's now look to all the things that are coming to us in the future. Do you not understand that? I mean, goodness gracious. He's telling you what's out ahead for, for those, these people here. He's telling them. And he, and he told you in verse 3 he was going to do that. He told you, blessed be the God of He Eulogio, I'm giving you a eulogy. I'm telling you about how great he was and who he is, how great he was and what he did in his life, how majestic it was he rose from the dead. You think that's all there is? There's more than that? They go, what, what's more than that? The life, the death, resurrection. Oh, no, there's more. Well, what do you mean there's more? Oh, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. What it means to you. That's where the more comes in, what it means to you. What because of that he now gives to you. What do you mean gives to me? Well, remember those years I taught you in Tyrannus? This is what I was trying to teach you. They're like, oh, wow, you got to be kidding me. No, no, no. But I'm just a Gentile. I know, right? It's crazy, right? I was killing folk, I know. I, I'm also, I don't deserve it either. That's why I told you beforehand, he called me out. I'm just telling you. I'm with you. Blows me away. I got it. So he goes into this, this aspect. So again, in verse 14, so you, you have all the, the pledge of the inheritance of us into a redemption of the possession, into the praise of the glory. So what does it mean practically now? It speaks to the type of that which is out ahead, but the now speaks to the fact that you do have a pledge of the inheritance, because right now, you have a partial pledge now manifest, manifested in the fact that if you've been given the understanding of the mysterion, if the secrets have been made aware to you, as he had mentioned earlier, from a Sophia skill clarity, and from the ability to have a mindset of understanding, that's a pledge God just gave you. You'll be in the heavens. You'll, you'll go there, as long as you don't backslide, that is. But you'll go to the, you're to the heavens. That, that's, that, that's God's pledge. But you and me, we have to have these things where he says, the, this pledge of inheritance that we're sealed with to get us there, it says it's for us to be into a redemption, into a praise of the glory of him, which is referring to us having to do the next part earlier in verse 11 where he says to have the ex clarinomion. We have to have an, an inheritance. Out of an inheritance, we have to earn that. It doesn't just come by just being there. You know, the, the reason why there's an entrance first and an inheritance later. 
But the rest of this chapter, the rest of the whole book, is going to talk about what he means by, okay, build on what you meant there, Paul, by, okay, we have this pledge, but then you all of a sudden you said into an apolutrosis, and you said into a praise of glory, but how do we go from a pledge to being into? And he's going to talk about the rest of that, the remaining chapters of the book. That's what he goes into about how to get there. And so interesting enough about that. So in verse 15, as we're continuing on, we've got maybe 15 minutes left here. He says, on account of this, or dia, or through this, through this, even I, having heard the in you faith, see the you? The you is the specific you. That's the humas. That's the specific group of people that are of the 60 fruit and above. Because he, see what he says? He goes back now to those. So he's talking about a general people of those who have the ability to have the, the ek clarinomion, and those who have the ability to have an into apolutrosis and into praise of glory. All of us who enter the heavens have that opportunity. But he's saying, specifically now, going back to narrowing his focus now, he goes into narrow focus again, because in verse 12 he talked about that he went in and out a little bit. He went in on the stewardship issue of the higher end of people on verse 10. He went differently on verse 11 about those who would have the ek clarinomon. He went in verse 12 talking about the Hamas, the specific people that's in order for them to have this glory. Then he went out and did a, did a telescopic view again in verse 13 about how we all have heard this, how we have been previously beforehand hopers. But then he goes into the pledge to all of us. Then he goes back into the specific nature again in verse 15. And he said, on account of 